Okay? That's incredible, it's switched on automatically. <laughs> um, so welcome to this talk, um, which is going to introduce you the GXP ASIC from HPE and uh, the experience that we face when we try to enable Linux on top of it. Uh, my name is Jean-Marie Verna. I'm working with uh, Louis Luciani on that program. So we are both part of the advanced development team uh, at HPE. So the role of our team is to enable technology that we believe could be relevant to the company within the next couple of years. So we are not working on short-term product. We are just we are working at enabling new tech, which could be really relevant within our roadmap. Um, we are here today just to present you the work that we have done on um, on the BMC side of the servers and the experiment that we, are, we have run regarding OpenBMC. So uh, first things, what, what is the BMC? How many of you are really familiar with the BMC infrastructure of a server? Okay, I can see that all the people who came are, have interest in doing that. <laughs> so it's here. So you can see there, that's a very small piece of hardware which is mainly sitting at the back of the, of the server. Um, I think it's still relevant with OCP hardware, but um, that's, a, that's mainly a system on chip infrastructure, um, which is coupled to a couple of uh, other chips like a CPLD and a, and a DRAM. And um, it's, um, it's there to manage the, the, the servers and giving you the opportunity to turn it off, turn it on, and managing the health uh, of the platform. Uh, there is something specific at HPE, is that this chip is not something that we purchase from the suppliers. We are still designing that, uh, that processor, and this is, a, this is a custom ASIC that we design. The main reason behind that is we believe it's really critical for a company like us uh, to own this technology for two main reasons. The first one is um, security, and the second one is uh, debugging the platform. So the BMC is the technology which is giving uh, access to all the hardware, and when there is issues coming up, so you, you need to, to be able to understand how to debug them properly. BMC are not new, and Louis is there to, to speak about um, the history of, uh, of the BMC. What is new is that we are enabling uh, Linux support on top of it. And there is a lot of reason why we decided to make it happen right now, and not before, and not within the next couple of years. So let's go ahead and deal with. Uh, thanks, John Marie. So, so if you can if you can indulge a little little quick history on this, so it really starts way past <laughs> over where John Marie is. So nineteen, so HPE had the the first x eighty six based server. We marketed you know a long time ago in the early nineties. Nineteen ninety two, we had a thing called Server Manager R, and the evolution. These were cards that were plugged into the servers. And it made it all the way up to where you see in the slides. So this is where we started having an, an embedded ASIC down on the motherboard. So the ones before that would do management, but things like, you know, it, it's back in the day, it'd send out a page to your pager if something, you know, unauthorized login, that kind of stuff. So now we embedded it. So interesting to this group is what kind of operating systems, you know, so it's been an evolution from operating systems all the way to embedded Linux to where we're going today. So we've hopped from, uh, you know, our first boards used ThreadX, and then we used, uh, before that, we used uh, um, VXWorks, and then uh, Green Hills Integrity, and so on. So we've started off with, with the ASICs themselves, a very humble ASIC called the just ILO, and then ILO2. ILO3 is the one where we started, you know, adding a lot of power to the ASIC. So uh, things like, you know, hardware-built AES encryption, more capable processor, you know, uh, an ARM 926, you know, for that kind of thing is actually pretty good. And then ILO 4 is where we started adding more, even more capable processors. Uh, so, so these are, you know, starting around, I'm sorry, starting around ARM 9, so it's like the, the Cortex A9 is where we're running things. And then the silicons continue to evolve. We have a, we have a, a group at HPE that, that designs the silicon for, for this and for other things. So um, one of the things, one of the advantages we have is we have the firmware team and we have the ASIC team, so we can, we can optimize a lot better. Uh, next slide. So why, why after all that, why are we going to Linux? So 
we start off with these reasons here. So uh, number one is the control plane is integrated into, a com into the computer arch architecture. It's more easily done with Linux. So when we say control plane, we're talking about, you know, there, there are a lot of things out in the industry. It's like security plane, management plane, control plane, data plane, you know, all that kind of stuff. So it's kind of, kind of mump, you know, kind of a gray area in there. So uh, control plane is, is uh, in this context, we're talking about it's running on the OS, it's calling down into the BMC to get to get sensor data and stuff like that, and then uh, and execute control. So Linux is more optimized because because typically you're going to have Linux running on the host, you're going to have Linux running in the in the BMC. So things things are you know uh, mesh up a lot nicer. That's one of the reasons. Uh, Linux is a well known and understood environment. So getting developers and things like that is a lot easier than than like for instance we have a. a our current operating system, you know, for the things we're selling today, it's not easy to find people that have that kind of embedded experience. Um, it's, it's, they can easily adapt, but it's still other, you know. So higher threats. So um, the thing is that some, in some cases, the, you know, a proprietary solution doesn't cover the whole spectrum of expect, expectations. So, so what we're trying to talk about there is, is that, uh, um, like some of these expectations are, are, I believe that that my OS is safe. I don't believe that the BMC is safe. You know things like that. So uh, this is we're sort of straying a little bit over towards OpenBMC. It's like, well, I own op my my instance of OpenBMC, therefore I trust it. You know, so that those those are things there. Um, and then common software base between vendors. So obviously, with uh, with uh, with embedded Linux. It helps us avoid, for instance, I can give an example. So with our, with our proprietary system, it's like we wanted to add a driver for a USB front port, right? So, um, so we, ha we had to handcraft it, we, uh, and, then, and then also we had to buy some elements of that. So, and then in the end, after all that money and time and all that, we ended up supporting a USB flash drive, and that's it. You know, not other USB devices, USB keyboards and all that. That's different. So. Um, with this, what it lets us do is we just obviously with open source, you know, the driver's already there, you know, the USB front port just, bloop, you know, works and it works and, you know, for all kinds of different devices and we didn't spend any money or any development time on that. And then lastly, um, the BMC hardware can do it. So the thing is that the, the, with the capabilities where we showed the evolution all the way, the capabilities are there now in the ASIC and our ASIC that will run open BMC rather nicely, even though, even though, um, Open BMC and Linux and all that's probably more, you know. I know I know that we're talking about embedded Linux and all that, but we're usually talking about a more capable processor running it, not, you know, really, you know, like an M4 or something like that. So, anyway, so those those are the those are the reasons why why we're doing it and we are doing it. Um, so that what this discusses is is leveraging GXP security. GXP is the name of our our, our ASIC that that we're shipping today. Um, so. Leveraging the security capabilities that are on there. So, so the one that really comes out is, is a feature we have called Silicon Root of Trust. So that's in the silicon itself. So, so if you're going to be building OpenBMC or anything, this is probably pretty interesting. So in the silicon itself, what we have is we have a hash for the, the, what we call the micro boot block, which is up there that's labeled number one. Okay, and then within that, in other words, you can't change that because if you change that, the hash isn't, the silicon isn't going to recognize it. Okay, so that's the silicon root of trust. So within that micro boot block, there are keys, a, a group of RSA keys that are used to check the signature of what comes next. So you have the micro boot block that launches, you know, it goes in this order right here. The micro boot block um, uh, goes up to, to the GXP loader, which I'm sorry if I can't find it here. Oh, way up there, and then jumps over to U-boot, and then and then launches. So that that's a chain. So if you're developing code that that's based on this, you can continue the chain all the way up, you know, to cover everything. So it's 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 anchored. To think of it this way, it's just anchored into the ASIC. Um, I guess Nick, did I miss something there, Jean Marie? I don't know if I got it. And is. What you see on that slide could look like something easy, but it took us a lot of time just to build up the whole software infrastructure to properly support that. So as I said during the previous talk, we work on enabling Linux since the past three years. So between the pandemic, 
building up the right tools to have uh, to build the environment and all the security impact that it has it does explain why it took us about three years between the first day and and and, and, uh, and the day we feel more comfortable about publicly disclosing what we are doing uh, around linux on gxp asic and um, the main reason behind this is there is a lot of work and uh, and that's uh, that that has been the main reason why it, why it took us uh, such an amount of time so we are currently scaling the capability to support and enabling Linux on, um, on GXP. And go ahead, Lois, that's up to you. OK, so this, this is shifting gears a little bit. So this is, this is uh, you're running OpenBMC. So the, the, challenge, the challenge is that you have these servers. You know, we make you know, millions of servers, right? So the challenge is all these servers that are out in the field, how do we keep the, protect them for, against somebody you know, using this mechanism to update to OpenBFC as a way to, in, you know, uh, introduce malware. You know, so I, I have this, say for instance, if I had a weak process, I could, I could you know, load, uh, you know, a rootkit or something like that into the ILO. So we want to prevent that. So that's why we have this transfer of ownership uh, thing. So it all starts off with, uh, I'm just going to give you a really high level view of it. So it starts off with you have a, somebody's interested in doing this. I want to, I have my ProLiant server. I want to be able to run OpenBMC on it and, and, and deploy that to my fleet, for instance. So it, start, it starts off with going to, to the, uh, what we call program office, you know, at hp.com. And um, it'll, it, it, uh, it enables you to, to, to build and sign your OpenBMC firmware. So we provide the keys and, and things like that that let you do that. And then uh, also as part of that process, uh, step number two is you have to have permission. This is, this is, uh, this is how we're kicking it off. This, isn't how prop this might not be how it's gonna be forever. So it's just how we're gonna start it. We wanna start it kind of contained, you know, because we wanna know who's doing that and if you have problems and all that, so, so we, can, we can help it. So, you know, help the process. So you go to the, the program uh, PMO office and after approval, uh, you will send HPE your public key. HPE will sign that public key with its private key and then send it back as part of a package. That package is installed on this USB key. And you don't have to use the USB key, but that's just for convenience right there. So, so you plug it in, you're on, you're, you're on the website. It builds the key for you with everything. And like I said, most importantly, the signed, uh, the signed public key, your signed public key. And then you, you, you plug in the USB key into the uh, system that you want to transfer ownership and it loads that key and kicks off the process where it loads the key so now you have two keys uh, so you have the HPE key and your key so you it, any firmware that comes in can sign can be signed by either and it will load that in there so uh, say you decide you want to sign your own open BMC and load it in there so that the next part of the process is is uh, we, there, there are several steps that have to be in the right order, but essentially you're loading uh, the servers off, you're loading the system ROM firmware, UFI image, there's a special image that you need for that. Um, then you're loading the OpenBMC uh, image. Um, uh, see, I'm going kind of out of order here. So, so some, those things happen, that your only feedback at that point is, that you, is when you plug in the key that you're gonna get Remember the server's off, so you're going to get a, a pattern with the LED in the front that says everything's cool or everything's not cool. Okay, so the server's off, ILO's on, so it's doing that kind of stuff. So if it did all of these steps correctly, then it's going to it's going to install the firmware, reboot the ILO. Uh, I'm sorry, install the ILO firmware, install the UEFI firmware, reboot the ILO, and then the server's going to reboot and it's going to come up running that UEFI firmware. Okay. Any questions on that? Because I, I feel like I kind of, you know, went the, funny order there. How does the UFI firmware fit into that? Or is that because um, the HPE UFI firmware thinks that there's an HPE ILO. Okay. So there, there are interfaces in there that have to tie up. Okay. And it's not the same for OpenBMC. Okay. So you're okay with people updating UEFI on their, on their server platform? I'm sorry, what? You're okay with people updating UEFI on their server platform for their own custom version? Well, it's you. You have to be okay with it because it's signed by you. By you. Yeah. Oh wait, is that? But that's that's an HPE UEFI version. So roughly for OpenBMC, uh, at the beginning we would have a specific ROM revision, right. 
Um, the main reason is because um, there's no standardized way uh, of communication between the BMC and the host and the realm. So we are trying to work with the community to try to standardize that. So we, we, we have options we, which we would like to provide. Um, the, the current realm is really relying on uh, proprietary technology from HP. It's not, it's not that we are not willing to open source it. It's more that it's, uh, it's tricky to, up, to, to make it happen because we need to upstream a lot of things into OpenBMC and it needs to get approved first. And, um, but that's, that's clearly something we want to get rid of. So we are trying to work, we are not trying, we are working extremely hard to try to have a single ROM instead of having two. Um, my best scenario would be that we might be achieving that somewhere next year. Uh, but uh, this is still, still a lot of work. This, this is all scriptable too, by the way, so you can tie it all together as if it were one operation if you wanted to. The, the key things for, re, regarding this process is when you are going to run open source firmware on HP platform, you will be benefiting from the silicon root of trust. And that's really key. We, we want to have end users um, having the same kind of experience they, they might be expecting uh, from, from IDO when we speak about security behavior. Uh, just, the, yeah, just quickly, uh, can you explain how you limit this to a subset of machines and how that works when like motherboards are swapped and all that? You need to have a specific user account uh, to get the USB reconnected. So the USBs are tied to a particular machine or they're tied to like a range of machines like the company might have? It's, it's, tie, it's currently tied to um, a specific user account with a specific credential and you need the customers needs to put, to put this credential on the USB key. No, that's not going to work because you still need the credential to be set up. So if the, if the account is not created by the company, so roughly how it works, you get, you get IDO. You need to create on the IDO interface a specific user account with credential that you own, your security officer own, and do not share with anybody. And then, then you get the USB key, and IDO is going to match the, the USB key with the user account which has been created. If you, if you give them permission to do it, they're, they can do it. And then there yeah. are other schemes like, well, we can make it certificate-based or something like that. But that's just kicking the can a little bit further back, right? At some point, you need a user, that you know, you a trust. dedicated user to install a certificate or any, anything like that. So why, you know, if you can kick the can, somebody's going to figure out that you can do that. So what's the point? So make it, you know, make it user-based if you have strong authentication, you know, in the end of the ILO. So that step, you can make... Uh, two-factor authentication, you know, there are all these, these uh, Kerberos, you know, LDAP, you know, all that kind of stuff. It can be installed on any piece of hardware if the user can't exist, but we can, we can enhance the security if it's needed for specific customer needs by using the ASIC ID and saying that image can be fitting only that specific machines. So there is a unique ID which is available on each platform, which hello. That's the dilemma that we face too, and, 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 and would love to hear your feedback. But one, one, of, the, one of the scenarios that, that we got a lot of feedback was gonna, that, you know, that customers were gonna hate is that if I, if I node locked it, you know, like what, what yeah. Jean-Marie was saying, with, with the ASIC ID, now, you know, I, I qualified all this stuff, now I wanna go deploy it to 10,000 servers. That, that's not gonna scale. So, and feedback from customers, were t they were telling us that, that, you know, they'd rather have this method to where they can deploy it in mass. So r roughly, we, we really can adapt the method based on the customer security feedback and expectation. The challenge is more, um, how do we enable that as a first step? Because it's needed, whatever happened, to enable um, the Linux kernel to boot on these platforms. And um, in the end, we believe that is still safe, 
So the, the challenge is more um, within each organization, people are trusting um, different group of people in different ways. So you, you, you get some very tight, very strict security behavior, or you get something which is wide open, depending on the company. And this is, this is something that we, we need to address on a customer by customer case. And that is why there is a PMO office, because depending on the requirement, we can adapt the, the process. That's, that's the other things. So, and, uh, and that's the main reason why it does exist. Because right now, without going through the PMO and getting, getting a way to update your firmware, uh, no, unlock your, your system, and it's not unlocked in the end, because in the end, it's, it's being locked to your keys, to your signature keys. So, which means that if your private key is safe somewhere, it's going to be pretty tough just to hack your systems from another customer image, whatever happened. So, we, we, are, we are assuming that there is a security officer at the, um, at the customer side, and the security officer will be in charge of putting in place the process inside the, co the company. That's the really key things. Suppose that you buy a server secondhand from someone who node locked it and used a key themselves, or it was you and you accidentally lost your private key somehow. What's the procedure in that case to get yourself back into that server? You go to the, you go to the PMO office. So the, the PMO office will be in charge of um, trusting you, so probably with through a proof of purchase or whatever, and, um, and then finding the right solution. The ultimate case is motherboard swap. That's the ultimate case. But you've got, already got, the HP key is still there, I assume. Yeah, the HP key is still there, but we're, 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 not, we're not going to uh, change ownership without being sure that both parties agree. But if, if, you, <laughs> if you lose your key, or you need to change it? If you lose your key, you get back to us. You, just, you go back to you and you can yeah. You give us another key, and we will, and you you have to go back through the same process in some way. And and we do not recommend to lose the private key. That's not a good <laughs> idea. <laughs> because whatever whatever happened, that is going to be a mess. Right. So <laughs> so, but I, I think any good security officer will tell you private key are not made to be lost. <laughs> you have a couple of good things that can save. Yeah. <laughs> you 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 have your own policy to save them. <laughs> Uh, a lot of questions on this slide, John. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, go. When you describe this process here, you mentioned there is two key. What type of this oh, two key? See, and then they are like private or per key, or they are corresponding to the public or the, the key that's already programmed that so you have to sign with? or And then you mentioned as well uh, the firmware. Is this firmware came from where? Is like customer firmware or from from you actually? So, so there there are two so. there are two public keys, right? So when you buy the server, it's only one public key. It's HPE firmware. So we you you can't flash anything through ILO that isn't signed by HPE. So the second one is the is the the customer the public key that corresponds to the private key that you would sign with your firmware or OpenBMC. If and so you'd sign OpenBMC with your private key. Public is is preloaded into the ILO, yes. and that's what it uses. And what type of hardware is RSA, or you are supporting different kinds of hardware? Uh, right, right now it's RSA 30, 30 what, 76? Is that right? No, RSA, which one? Or I never know. I can't Don't remember. ask me. I'm not the guy who's taking care of that. <laughs> that's yeah, it's RSA, RSA 40, 30, 40, 76, 90, I think. Yeah. Yeah. It's 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 the one. There are two RS, two RSA the two RSAs that are allowed by CNSA. So if you operate it, and you know there's a list of ciphers that's published. It's called a CNSA suite, and those are the ones. Th those are the highest ones. So those two are allowed. So ILO ILO will accept those two, you know, and um, and the, the hashing algorithm has to be SHA three eighty four. No no others. That's that's. I'm kind of going into a, a, an area here, but ILO has different security modes. At, at the highest mode, that's what's required. Okay. Thank you. So when migrating to OpenBMC? Sorry? 
I didn't hear you. <laughs> uh, why, are we, why are you migrating to OpenBMC? When the machine has been unlocked. So roughly, this is the last step within the red square there. So we transfer the ownership, you install a ROM first, and then you install OpenBMC. No, yeah, why to OpenBMC? Before that, you had your own, HP had his own, their own. Ah, why do we want to install OpenBMC? Right. Uh, in our cases, we don't want to install OpenBMC. That's mainly our end users who are oh, willing to users. gain that capability. And, and we think it's a good idea too. So, um, but um, it could be other things than OpenBMC. So as long as it's supporting on the, uh, on the ASIC, so we know that we can run Green Hills and Linux. So as long as it's based on Linux, you can, you can boot up whatever you want. So if you are building up your own user space environment for a BMC, that's fine. So HP gives the open BMC image or no? No, HP is not providing any kind of open BMC image. We are providing, we are upstreaming um, driver capability into the Linux kernel. So if you go to the Linux kernel mailing list, you would be seeing uh, uh, some, some threads around GXP uh, drivers but the end user has to recompile its own OpenBMC image and signing up. Right, so I, I work on the BM, OpenBMC area, but to do that, we need to know a lot more about the platform, like say what sensors you got where and all that kind of stuff. So we do, we do provide a user space environment into OpenBMC, okay. and we are under the process to upstreaming it. Oh, so it's currently okay. available publicly as a fork within the ULET Packard GitHub organization repo. Oh. But we, we, we soon upstreamed a lot of things into, into OpenBMC. The challenge that we face currently is it has been written by HP engineers with HP code signings or quick and dirty mode. <laughs> so we, we are now uh, cleaning up the code and make it compliant with the code stylings that all the uh, uh, open source organizations are expecting when submitting code. Oh, okay, understood. So you upstream all your OpenBMC ports. Yeah, the, the, can add their own stuff onto it and then install it. Yeah, the okay. intent that we have clearly is upstreaming everything that we have and telling to our end users if they want to run OpenBMC on HP platform, they have to rebuild from the upstream. Okay. So everything which would be outside the upstream is not going to be any kind of supported features from HPE. Okay. All right, thank you. That's my question. Thanks. Let's try to move forward. A lot of questions here. So the key things um, to, to keep in mind is you cannot run any kind of Linux operating system on the GXP ASIC without transferring the ownership and becoming liable for the security of your system. So that's the, that's the key point. Um, the way we transfer the ownership is open. So what we describe here is the current way it is set up. So we, we might be adapting depending on, on your request and, um, and your needs. So that's the key point. But there is a very strict rule, so you need to have security officers being able to recompile OpenBMC or the Linux kernel. So we, we have a lot of discussion with uh, end users. We went through that process um, through a couple of um, beta test end users, and it, it went okay. Everything is okay. And, and that works fine. So all the, everything which is presented to the, today has been tested at scale, I would say, with the uh, Darius end users. So we got feedbacks and we built up that strategy with their, with their input in some way. So now let's enter a little bit uh, more uh, around the technology. So what is the GXB BMC and what's inside the BIS? So, in, um, so that is this ASIC that you can see there. That's a uh, zoom in pictures. Um, where it does connect, it connects to the source bridge of the infrastructure. Let me go fast to the global I.O. interfaces. So uh, that's a traditional SOC in some way. So there is a memory controller. You can interface DDR3 or DDR4 uh, memory interface. Uh, it can connect to an expansion bus where we have a couple of devices like NVRAM. Uh, or I square C um, devices to monitor um, the platforms. We have a concept uh, which is called CF sensors. So we got, I would say, dozens of thermal sensors within uh, each HP servers from which you can gather um, health status of the machines and use, use this input uh, to optimize the management of the platform. So you can get access to this through 
through the expansion bus. We had a couple of spy interfaces. So we had the BMC flash, the system flash. There's something interesting into the GXP ASIC. So we, we can boot the host um, by using um, a ROM which is sitting in RAM instead of directly accessing the spy devices. Um, that's pretty efficient for updates or for testing. Um, the, um, the other thing is, um, what should I add about the ROM? Uh, yeah, the ROM is directly connected to the BMC. It's not connected to the, to the PCH. Traditionally, um, the, the, the spy uh, flash which uh, contain the ROM can be connected to the, uh, the PCH. That's not a, a technical choice that we, we made. Just wanted to add that there's some really good security benefits to that too. Yeah. For, there's recent bugs like there's, re, uh, I can't even talk about, but um, that there are, you know, the system flash attached to the south bridge made it vulnerable. You know, being behind, you know, our ASIC made it not vulnerable. And then what John Marie was talking about, RAM based, also has security benefits. Um. So um, we have two network interfaces. Um, we, we are using only one, I think, currently. Uh, no, the, the main reason why we have two is that we, we, we might be able to share the network interface between the host and the BMC. I'm not sure if we are enabling that in any kind of our servers, but that might be the case. Uh, we got a bunch of UART. Um, a lot of us square C interfaces, so 10 buses. Um, we get uh, two clocks. The main reason why uh, we have two clocks is one is feeding the, um, uh, the core and one is feeding the USB stack. Um, we get uh, video support inside uh, the ASIC. So on any HP servers, you might be seeing a video interface available from the host. Uh, that's very efficient because we also integrate a video encoder. Um, so once, a, oops, sorry about that. So what's inside the chip by itself? So that is the current generation. That's a traditional SOC from, uh, I wouldn't say from ARM, but from HPE. So everything is connected to a, an AHB bus inside the, the SOC. You get a single Cortex A9 uh, CPU. Um, it's not the most powerful ARM CPUs, but that's way good enough uh, for what we have to do at the BMC level. L2 cache memory controller, which supports DDR3 or DDR4, as I said, a single chip. Um, we have a, an interrupt controller and um, a PCI uh, IP block, which does contain a few IO subsystems, including the PCI interfaces for the, the Intel uh, CPUs. Um, we have the eSpy and the LPC uh, controller, which are directly connected to, to the host. A video IP block, a spy engine, Something which is very specific to BMC, uh, what we call C for CPLD interfaces. So um, as we have a lot of interface to connect to the BMC, to save some um, pinout options from, um, uh, from the ASICs, so we are connecting um, that, um, the ASIC to, um, I would say, a specific FPGA. I, I don't know if I can say that uh, CPLD is an FPGA, but. I hope people are not going to tell me by saying that, but <laughs> uh, a CPLD is roughly an FPGA which is gathering all the IO subsystems uh, from, a, uh, from a complex architecture and serialize that uh, to another component, avoid uh, reducing the number of pins that you need. And this is another abstraction layers between the, the host and, uh, and the BMC chip and the ASIC by itself. Um, it has a high level of importance because uh, when we port Linux to, the, uh, uh, to this kind of uh, technical architecture, we need to take care about that connectivity. And it's pretty uncommon within the Linux space currently. There is no abstraction layer within the Linux kernel regarding CPLD interfaces. And uh, we need to address that because each time we are pushing for patches uh, uh, and we try to upstream that, we got some pushback from the community telling us, hey, what is that? What is it doing? So we do not really understand uh, uh, the, the block diagram or what you are intending to do here. And um, that's also why we, we decided to participate to this kind of conferencing and trying to disclose more how the PMC works and why we need to, to get this kind of code integrated. Yeah. Looks like we are going to take questions during the session instead of the end. <laughs> that's fine. Five minutes? Hoops. <laughs> Are you going to expose any of the um, 
UART or SPY headers so that the um, customer can um, add some sensors or anything like that since you're having an open BMC anyways? Uh, currently, no. Uh, the, the main reason is that um, we, we are driven by cost in some way because our customers are expecting us to deliver them a cost-optimized solution and security. So we, we, try to, we try to avoid to expose everything which could, I would say, uh, break up the system. So that's also why we developed um, the, the CI tools, because you, you, you really can hack the system through the CI tools. I would say this is more a developer environment that you are looking for in that case. And, um, and that's, that's something that we do at our level, and we can share specific systems on a case-by-case -case basis. But um, that's not what we are intending to do on the production machine. So just quick emphasis on the CPLD interfaces. So that's a proprietary bus. Uh, it's self-training, so that's easy to implement uh, because everything is uh, done in hardware, just a few parameters uh, at the software level. Uh, the Picky platform is also something specific to BMC in some way because we are retrieving uh, critical data from the CPU just to know what is the current thermal temperatures and voltage and, and so on. And we need to take decisions based on, uh, on these data. Uh, all CPLDs is mainly focused on GPIO management and fan status and generating the right PWM uh, signals to handle the fans. Uh, let me, you said four minutes? Okay, let me jump on that one. <laughs> uh, I think it's important to understand uh, how um, a BMC uh, is, is, is set up. So there, there are register banks which are used to configure the SOC by itself. This is everything that you can see on the left-hand side of the slide. So the slide is going to be public. You, you will be able to, to, to look at it. But um, if you read the drivers that we publish as a proof of concept within the ULED Packard uh, GitHub organization, you will be seeing some, this address space being used by all the different drivers. So like that, you can have a better sense of why we are jumping from that memory space to another one. Um, we also have uh, direct access to the host registers. So two main reasons for that. Um, the first one is debugging capability when something goes wrong on the host. And the second one is uh, setting up the, the BMC properly. So how do we know um, the UART speed which has been set up within the realm? So there might be different ways. So either we read the host registers or we, we, we have a direct path to communicate with the realm and getting that parameter back to the BMC. So this is all this kind of hint that we need to implement. And that is why the register bank is, splitted, is split between three area. So the, the SOC by itself, the host registers, and the CPND. So the CPLD area is dedicated at fan management and getting status uh, through GPIO. And when you will be reading uh, some of our uh, device drivers, you will be seeing that uh, we need to map uh, three different regions within the device tree description. Um, I know that some people are really not upset about that, um, surprised about this kind of approach for an SOC. But the challenge is really that we, we, we really wanted to um, help the software engineers to really understand that when they are accessing one specific memory regions, they are accessing um, either the, the SOC, the host, uh, or the CPND, avoiding to create bugs if we had only a common um, memory region. That's the way it's implemented on HP platform. And I think we are not going to change that tomorrow. Uh, but um, that's, that's really important to understand that. So where do we stand regarding the Linux port? Um, I'd like to congratulate Nick, by the way. So we, we got our first patches which have been approved into the Linux kernel. And, um, and it's working. You can boot a GXP ASIC on the CI. You do not have any kind of device drivers which are available from the Linux kernel yet, so you still need to use the fork that we have. But uh, we got the basic which works, the serial uh, uh, memory controllers, um, the, the flash access, and, and the clock drivers, um, the watchdog also. Um, what are the challenges that we faced? Uh, first of all, for many of us, this is the first time we upstream into the Linux kernel. So we didn't find the right how-to 
or it was hedging. So we got a lot of pushback or good feedbacks from the community around um, the patches quality that we supplied. The good news is we learned also that we need to provide documentations and uh, we were not aware about that. So we, we were just excited at providing code instead of providing the documentation with the, with the infrastructure. But we got the, all the feedback and now I think we are, we are in a good shape at upstreaming all the drivers. And that's, that's the really key things. And that's really our intent. And um, the next step is really to um, accelerate around driver upstreaming. So you can help us in some way because the proof of concept drivers are all available uh, in, uh, in the open world. And we need to transform that uh, from a proof of concept code to something which can be accepted into the Linux kernel. So that might be a good way for you to start learning how the GXP ASIC works or um, helping us. This is my last slide. Um, how can you get involved uh, if you want to help us? So this is the small team who is working on OpenBMC, including Lewis, and some of the team members couldn't be there during the, the picture. So we are, we are probably lacking half of the team on that picture. But if you want to help us, you can review the code that we have uh, within the Unit Packard GitHub repo and uh, help us to upstreaming it, uh, give us feedback. And uh, if you need more uh, technical information or you have questions, we created specific mailing list where you can send emails. And this is just going to uh, come into my mailbox, uh, perhaps Nick, um, perhaps Lewis. So, but you, you have direct contact with our engineering team and you, you will be able to, um, to, to get answers. I'm not promising that we can answer to everything because that's, um, uh, the open source world is a little bit new to us, so we cannot disclose everything about what we do <laughs> inside the company. But uh, that's, uh, our intent is to collaborate. And I'm done because otherwise the lady at the back is going to kill me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I, we don't have time for a question. Sorry about that. <laughs> Thank you.